Hi, AP Chemistry students. Today is November 17th, 2022. You probably will be coming back from your Week Without Walls field trip tomorrow, but I meant to record this a few days ago and things got a little busy here. But anyhow, this is the one video lesson you will have for the week that I will share with you so that you can watch it and take notes on this, okay? So this video is meant to talk about the dipole moment and polarity or non-polarity of molecules and orbital hybridization, all right? So that's what this topic will be about. So please, as you watch the video, take good notes and review, all right? Now I shall begin. So what I will do here is we will start talking about what a dipole moment is first, okay? So a dipole moment is when you are doing these sort of arrows. So what I'll explain is on these arrows, you're basically going to use these dipole moments, which are basically showing you a difference of the electronegativity. If you remember, we had calculated delta En before. Remember the difference in two atoms electronegativity values. So we had done that before on a different lesson. And so you have my version of the American periodic table for you that has the electronegativity values, right? In the upper right corner of every box. And that's how we are able to get delta En. And if you remember, we had talked about three different types of polarity. One that is very, very polar, which is ionic. So that's when delta En is greater than 1.7. And then you have somewhere between 0 0.4, 0 0.5 to 1.6 to 1.7. That's a little bit debatable, remember? So that middle range is going to be polar covalent. It has some polarity. And then if you're below 0.5, like 0 to 0.4 for delta En, you're definitely going to be extremely covalent or non-polar covalent. So that's the review from last time. But basically what we're going to do is, now that you know about electronic and molecular geometry of molecules, as we had learned when we talked about like tetrahedral, trigonal planar, you know, things like that, those, those shape names. Now we need to apply that with the polarity stuff. So what the dipole moment is, we're gonna draw these vectors, which is what they are. They are vectors of polarity, or should we say of the difference in electronegativity. So basically you are going to, whatever molecule or Lewis structure you draw, okay? Hopefully you will be able to draw these dipole moment arrows and how you do that is the tip of the arrow always goes towards the atoms that are more electronegative and the tail will be on the less electronegative atom. So that's how you will draw the dipole moment vectors or arrows, right? So now, depending on the geometry of that particular molecule, so example, carbon dioxide, CO2, we knew that from the geometry that it is linear. Okay, so we had determined that already. We did the steric number SN. And so when we knew that carbon dioxide is linear, when I draw these two dipole vectors and I'm having one go towards the oxygen on one side, the other one go towards the oxygen on the other side. So then since this is perfectly 180 degrees, those two dipole moment vectors will cancel each other out. Just like the forces on a seesaw balancing each other out, right? So this is how we're going to use dipole moment to determine the overall polarity of a molecule. So even though there is a difference in electronegativity values between each carbon oxygen double bond, you know, bond like pair, it doesn't mean that the entire molecule of carbon dioxide is polar. Because of these dipole moments canceling each other out, that's why overall the carbon dioxide is not a polar molecule. So it's non-polar, all right? Okay, so move on to the next one. This is another compound, the one I asked you to watch in your video. Remember about the Haber process, that 22 minute video you watch on YouTube. And this was the making of ammonia. This is the compound ammonia, NH3. Now, if you remember from your table of the geometry, the separ, right, with the electronic and molecular geometry, you are um, to do the Lewis structure all from scratch, do it on your own, figure out the geometry, 
Remember, the geometry is very important. So you need to figure out your geometry and what exact shape it is, right? Whatever that may be from that table. And then so if you were to determine that correctly for NH3, you would find out that you would draw this molecule like this in 3D. And there would be a lone pair on top here. Now it's not shown in this picture, but remember there would be two electrons on top of this nitrogen. And then the three hydrogens are just kind of surrounding the nitrogen elsewhere. So this is the shape that you would have for NH3. So with this particular configuration, now you can draw your dipole moment arrows. So when you draw them, you are going to draw them towards the nitrogen from the hydrogen because nitrogen will be more electronegative than hydrogen. So that's why the tip of these arrows will go towards the end nitrogen. But then what about the lone pair that's on top of nitrogen? Well, whenever you have a lone pair, the dipole moment arrow, arrow, the tip, will go towards those electrons because clearly the electrons are particles of negative charge and they will definitely have higher negativity than an atom. So the tip of the dipole moment will always go towards the electrons, okay? Now, with that said, with these three together and this one here, how do we determine the overall polarity? Well, the thing is these three, okay, plus that one. So it's like this one over here just basically is going to add to whatever is already going towards those electrons, okay? But then these two guys here that go towards the nitrogen, they will go towards the nitrogen. If you were to do it like in physics class or math class where you learn about vectors, you guys are in grade 11 and 12 now, so I think you should know about vectors in math or physics. So these vectors here that are inward towards the nitrogen from the side hydrogen, they would have overall some kind of sum vector going up. So basically overall, the sum vector, that's like the net like dipole moment vector for the entire NH3 is gonna be some kind of arrow force or vector going up, vertically up away from the molecule going somewhere up there, okay? So basically they will not cancel each other out, right? Like the balanced vectors that you saw on the previous carbon dioxide. So over here, they will clearly not cancel out. And so you will have still some overall net dipole moment vector left over. And because of that, that makes this ammonia a polar molecule because I can't cancel out this dipole moment vector, all right? So that is really the first few examples of how we use dipole moment with the geometry of molecules. Now, this, is going to be a problem I want you guys to do, all right? So down here, this is a little organic chemistry that we haven't really learned yet, but it doesn't matter. These are benzene rings, okay? They're basically the same compound, right? They're the six ring structure, right? They're hexagons and they're double bonds, okay? Between each carbons that are like kind of skipping one at a time. So anyway, those three double bonds in the benzene ring, now, the only difference between these two, when we talk about orso or para, all that means is that in orso, we have two like additional functional groups. These would be the halogens, chlorine, attached to the carbons of this first carbon-carbon double bond, close to each other as possible. And then para, okay, is gonna be opposite from each other on opposite ends of the six, you know, sided ring, okay? So basically that's all orso and para mean. It's just the way that it looks physically. But anyhow, these are the two compounds we're talking about here. I'm asking you, okay, which of these two structures is going to be polar and nonpolar, okay? And here are the electronegativity values of chlorine and carbon from the periodic table. So chlorine's electronegativity is 3.1 and carbon is 2.5. So obviously you can take 3.1 minus 2.5 and you get delta E, okay? So that would be the value of the electronegativity difference between chlorine and carbon. Now, when I'm analyzing this, this is something beyond what you've learned so far with me with the other simple covalent compounds, because these, these are more complicated covalent compounds when we talk about these kind of organic compound rings. But nevertheless, I'm only really going to focus on the dipole moment arrows. 
So we're not going to be too focused on the entire structure here. Because like when we did CO2 and we did NH3, we were looking at the entire structure. But over here, I just need to pay attention to wherever there is a big difference, okay, or a significant difference between two atoms electronegativity. And that would just be between, okay, the chlorine and the carbon. So let's do this on paint together and I will show you how it would be done. Okay, so here is that palm again. Now, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more here. And so what I'm gonna do is I am going to draw the dipole moment arrows on okay, these molecules, but just in the places where I care about the chlorine and carbon. So that would clearly just be in this part of the ring. So this, by the way, in case you don't know, when I have this, you probably, for those of you who are not familiar with organic chemistry, that would be a carbon at that little intersection, right? And then this would be a double bond to another carbon here. And this carbon is connected to that chlorine. And this carbon is connected to another carbon here in a single bond between two carbons here. So this would be single bonds. These would be double bonds, right? Anyways, we only care about like where we see the chlorine. So. The first dipole moment arrow I would draw would be from this carbon to chlorine. The chlorine has electronegativity of 3.1 and carbon is 2.5. So clearly chlorine is more electronegative than the carbon. So the dipole moment arrow will go, so let me get a appropriate colors for you. Sorry, <laughs> having a little technical difficulty. Wow, I think I need to make this bigger. Sorry, guys. I am using a new pen today and it's apparently not working. That's a really big tail, sorry about that. And I do it for the other guy as well over here. So that would be the dipole moment of the other carbon chlorine. Anyhow, now, if I have two vectors going out like that, okay, then, their net vector or net sum dipole moment vector would be somewhere in the middle. Make sense? Okay. So if you have to sum them up, they don't cancel each other out. So then they would be, this would be the net one. This would be the, the overall net. Okay. Yeah. This is the net dipole. That's what we mean by the sum. Okay, so that's the net dipole. Now, if I do the other one, let's take a look at this one, the para version. So again, the chlorine, the opposite of each other, but I still need to do the dipole moment arrow. So this one clearly will go towards the chlorine going up. And this one would be towards the chlorine going down. Now, these are of equal difference, right? That's whatever that may be, 3.1 minus 2.5, 3.1 minus 2.5, they have equal magnitude and opposite directions exactly, okay? Like in a linear way, like a really opposite of each other. So overall, there is no net die pole, okay, uh, moment. Sorry, this pen is worse than my last one. Good God, and it's more expensive too. Ranting again. I apologize if I can't spell my words out. <laughs> you know what I mean, okay, moment. There's no net dipole moment on this one, all right? So that means that then this is the one that is going to be polar, got it? Because why? There is a net dipole still left over, okay? But in para, this would be nonpolar because there's no leftover, okay, polarity here. So this is nonpolar for sure. And this is gonna be polar, right? So hopefully 
that would make sense on how you do dipole warming. And you'll get some homework problems when you come back to do more molecules like this. There will be a whole poster for you to do of this dipole moment. Got it? All right, move on to the next topic. This will be the last one for today. I didn't want to make this video too long. Okay, now that we established that our dipole moment determines polarity, let's talk about then orbitals, okay? Now, for those of you who don't know what hybridization means, okay, that's something that we'll get back to um, because if you have such little class time in the last few weeks, I wanted to do a whole lesson on hybridization, but I thought that I would do this one first before we get deeper into hybridization because we need to do an experiment with that in class so that you can see it more visually. But for this one, all you need to know how to do is what we did with the geometry, electronic and molecular geometry. So that's fine that we understand those shape names. And now you know something about dipole moments. And I also taught you about the steric number how uh, we were able to use that to determine like, you know, not only the geometries, right, but also the SP or SP2, SP3, right, determination of each of those molecules. So this is sort of a review of that again, but going into a little bit more um, kind of a different perspective of it. So first thing I want to talk about here is basically what does this mean here? Okay, so basically, remember, we have only four types of orbitals. We have the S-shaped one, we have the P, right? And there's the P, there's three, right? Possible versions of the P orbitals, P, X, P, Y, P, Z. And then we have like five D-shaped orbitals, remember? There's only one S one, don't forget. One S-sphere one. There's three like, you know, P orbitals. And then there's five, right? D-type orbitals and the seven type F orbitals. So if remember those, those were all different shapes, okay? But when bonding happens, when atoms join together, right? Then the orbitals of those two atoms will come together. They'll have to jo join and merge. So when they merge together or combine, then that's why they are called hybrid orbitals. Hybrid is to combine, okay? Now, now the number of hybrid orbitals equals the number of atomic orbitals that came together or combined in the first place. And that's important. And that will be tied in basically to your steric number. If you remember what the steric number was, okay? Like if I was talking about BE and then F2 here, a steric number, SN, is basically going to be what? The number of atoms that are around that central atom, there's two, and how many lone electrons are around okay, the central atom, which there are none. So that's zero plus two, and then steric number here is two, right? So then I, I taught you that if steric number is two, that would give you your electronic and molecular geometry, right? But also it will let you determine that this is SP hybridization. And how do we know it's SP? Well, because the steric number is two, that means I can only have one S orbital and one P orbital right? Because that's one plus one. There's an implied exponent of one and one here above the S and P. So one plus one will give you the steric number of two. And then, so what that means is for SP hybridization, it means I have two main regions of electron density, okay? So that means that my main region of electron density will clearly be the fluorine atoms. There are no lone electrons around BE anyway, so that's not going to be an electron density region. So the electron density region will have to be the fluorines um, on both sides of the beryllium, okay? So, and this is 180 degrees if you did the, you know, VSEPR table that I gave you, right? So, and that's how we do SP hybridization. Now, this is our favorite polyatomic ion that we did the resonance structure before, remember? Carbonate, CO3, two minus. This was the one that has three different versions of it where you can switch that double bond. So go back and look at those notes if you forgot about CO3. But anyhow, for carbonate, how do I know it's sp2? Well, let's determine steric number first. The steric number here, we have three atoms around the carbon and there are no lone electrons around the carbon. So that's 
three plus zero, that would give you a steric number or SN of three, right? So that would be three. That means that would tell you the electronic and molecular geometry, okay? But now for SP2 hybridization, if I know I have then a steric number of three, I'm not allowed to have more than three orbitals, right? So that means that I would have SP2. Now, why is it not S2P1? Well, as I told you, there's only one S sphere orbital, but the P orbital, you can have up to a maximum of three. So that's why I would have an SP2 and not an S2P1, okay? I would not have S2P. It has to be SP2 because S can only have one orbital maximum. The P can go up to a power of three because there can be three P orbitals, P, X, P, Y, P, Z. So that's why it's SP2 hybridization, okay? Now for the last one, that's our ammonia again. And then here we have for steric number SN, there are three atoms attached to the nitrogen, right? So that would be three already for three atoms. And then there is a lone pair on the nitrogen. So that's one lone pair. So that would be then three plus one. That would give you a total of four for steric number SN, meaning that I can have no more than four orbitals. So I know that S can only have one orbital. That means I would have to have three P orbitals because one S orbital plus three P orbitals would give you a total of four orbitals. And that's why this NH3 is gonna be SP3 hybridization, all right? So hopefully that gives you an idea of what orbital hybridization is like. So now we would do one last example and then this video lesson will be over. So please continue taking notes. This is your next prompt. So look at it carefully and let me just kind of move this screen away. Okay, so in this thing here, you have a really ugly looking organic compound. Never mind the entire molecular structure because that's not what you're going to be concerned about. You are only to determine hybridization for just a few places on this quite complex molecular structure. So you're going to focus on the first carbon over here in this first square. And then that's called carbon at position A. This is not a bond, by the way, don't confuse it. This is not some single bond to some atom called A. No, that's just, this carbon is connected to this carbon by a double bond, connected to this carbon in the ring, and connected to this carbon that's down here, okay? Not connected to A at all. It's just saying that this is position A. So I really didn't like how they kind of like um, use black and white for this. So I'm gonna actually show you the same picture somewhere else so I can circle exactly what you're supposed to be doing, okay? Okay, so let's look at this again without all that interference from form. So let me find a way to put this somewhere useful. And I'm going to circle that in red where I want you to look at. So I'm looking at position A. I'm looking at position B. This is another carbon here. And then position C. These are the three positions of carbons that I want you to determine hybridization. So basically what you're going to do is, by the way, this carbon on the side, on the left, some students don't know what that means. This is not an element or a compound, okay? This looks like this. If I had to reinterpret how to draw that, it would look like a carbon here. There would be your O over there. And then over here would be a hydrogen. There would be another hydrogen here. And that would be another hydrogen here. So that carbon is connected to four atoms, okay? So single bond to three hydrogens and then a single bond to that oxygen. So that's what that means here. It's not connected to atom B. There's no atom B, okay? It's not boron here, no. This is just position B. So please don't confuse that. I don't like how they have that. I'm gonna draw those in green so that you know these are just connections, okay? Not actual bonds. So. R not bond. All right. Okay, anyways, now, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a look then at all these three atoms, these three carbons. So basically you would determine the steric number for hybridization, okay? 
So let's start with position A first, okay? This is this carbon over here. So this carbon, if you're doing steric number for position A, wow, this really doesn't follow my thing. Oh, this is the worst pen I've ever used. Pardon me, let me just undo all that. Apparently it raises better than it writes. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Okay, so I don't know what's going on here. I think my pen is running out. This is my new pen, you all, in case you want to know. But I've had better ones. Okay, so let's just kind of move that down a little bit here. What I'm talking about then, maybe make it not so thick. For carbon at A, okay? So here, the steric number is going to equal how many atoms are attached to it. Carbon here, carbon here, carbon here. That would be three. Okay. And then plus how many lone pairs of electrons are around that carbon? There would be zero. So that would be a steric number of three. That means then for this one over here, we know for sure that this is going to be sp2, okay? Right, because one s orbital plus two p orbitals will give you a steric number of three. So that one is gonna be sp2. Now over here, we're gonna do then the carbon at position B, okay? That's, that's steric number, oh, that's just, Hideous. Spending more time erasing this than actually writing. All right, if you like that. Okay, this is a Vietnamese product, so I'm not gonna blame it. This steric number. Okay, let's look at this. Let's take a look at the one I drew in red, okay? So with this steric number here, the carbon is connected to four other atoms and no lone pairs of electrons. So the steric number is clearly gonna be four plus zero, which is gonna be equal to four, right? That means that this guy here will then be, okay, that would be then for this one, S, P, Three, okay? This is clearly gonna be sp3 on this one, hybridization. And then that leaves over here, this carbon at this position, which I'll use the purple color now. So over here, for this steric number, the steric number is gonna be then, right? You have two atoms, the nitrogen and carbon, are the only two things it's connected to. This is a triple bond, and here's a single bond. So that would be three, I'm oh, sorry, that would be two uh, atoms that are attached to that carbon. So that's two. And then there's no lone pair, so that's zero. So then the steric number is two, which means that this carbon here is gonna have a SP hybridization. That's it, okay? So review this one. This position A has SP2 hybridization. This carbon on the left is sp3, and this carbon here up here with the triple bond is going to be sp hybridization. So hopefully you now understand what orbital hybridization means. And that is your lesson for today. I hope you took good notes in it, and I will see you in class when you guys come back, AP Chemistry. Bye for now.